Today's scripture reading is from the book of James in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we may be a kind of first fruit of all he created. This is God's word. Thanks for joining us today. Happy Father's Day. We've just begun a summer series, Ancient Data for a Digital Age, in the New Testament book of James. When I first became a Christian, I remember gravitating to James. It was a very attractive book to me. I think because it was so practical and easy to read, always seemed to be dealing with things that I was facing, whether stress or how to deal with difficult people, how to control my tongue when dealing with difficult people, and how to connect what I believed with my day-to-day life. And that was especially true with the subject of today, temptation. Struck me as so real, so true to my own experience, this anatomy of the inner workings of my soul. I think people have been so drawn to James' words here because it's a universally relatable topic. Oscar Wilde famously quipped, I can resist everything except temptation. James is sympathetic and here helps us find the way to tackle temptation by teaching us about the source of temptation, the strategy behind temptation, and the solution for it. The source of temptation. So where does it come from? In his words right before what we're focusing on today, James talks about trials we all face in life that are like tests God uses to mature us. He sums up that segment by saying, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Then in the very next sentence, our passage today, he talks about being tempted. At first, it seems like he's shifting subjects, but turns out the word trial and tempt are actually the same word in Greek. But the context here shifts from the external pressures and pain of life to the inner turmoil of the soul. What's the connection? Every time pressure hits from without, it's an occasion to wander from within. All trials come with opportunities for temptation. I bet if you think about it, you can identify over the last several months as all the various pressures have pushed down upon you, ways you've been tempted. Have you been short with someone, for instance? Wait, so if God puts trials in our life, you might be saying, are you saying God tempts us? James seems to anticipate that question. When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. You don't have to go very far in the Bible for temptation to pop up. The very first human struggled with it and succumbed to it. And when God asked them about it, they sort of set the precedent for humans ever since. Adam, why'd you do it? Who? Me? Oh, that. It was the woman you gave me. Classic blame shifting. It was Eve's fault, but see what he was doing. He was ultimately blaming God. If you hadn't placed her here in my life, I wouldn't have turned away from you. It's your fault. But James is saying that's just not right. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Now, I want you to notice, while James is an incredibly practical book, he never separates our ethical obligations from our theological commitments. If you take James or any other book of the Bible, for that matter, and strip them of what it's teaching about God, the central subject, to give you some practical helps for life, it's not like you've just filed off the rough edges. You've actually cut out the core of its content. See, James is always saying, if you want to grow as a person, if you want to find stability amidst the storms of life and success against the things that seduce you from within, what's most essential is a robust understanding of who God is for you. What does he emphasize here about God? He's good to the core, supremely, majestically holy. He wants what is best for us. So we should never imagine that he's tempting us. In fact, he's so committed to our overcoming evil, 
He entered the battle himself by sending his son onto the front lines. At the very beginning of his ministry, Luke tells us Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Astounding that the Spirit led Jesus, the Son, into the wilderness. But notice very careful language here. God the Spirit isn't tempting Jesus. He places him in a pressure situation, the wilderness, but it was the devil who tempted him. Though this obviously is a heavy subject in my twisted memory, this always reminds me of the great comedian when I was growing up, Flip Wilson, who would turn to the camera and say, the devil made me do it. Well, back to the wilderness. Interestingly, though the devil tempted Jesus, Jesus never gave in. And James is clear about where the source of temptation is at its deepest level. Each person, he says, is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. We'll dig into that a bit more in a second. But what James wants us to own is that we, no one or nothing else, are responsible for yielding to the wayward ways of our heart. It's like this t-shirt I remember seeing one time, lead me not into temptation, I can find the way myself. Temptation originates deep within the complicated, often confounding world within us. What the poet John Donne poignantly described is our poor, intricated soul, riddling, perplexed, labyrinthical soul. That's a sobering place to start for sure, owning that our ultimate source of temptation lies within us and our riddling, perplexed, labyrinthical souls. That's the source of temptation first. Secondly, let's go behind the scenes more to see the strategy that lies behind temptation. James is saying there's a sense in which our soul is working against us. With vivid language, he describes that self-destructive strategy as seduction. Temptation happens when we get seduced by our own desire. Not only should we resist temptation because it's bad, but James says we should do so because if we recognize this strategy at work behind it, we'll see it's actually bad for us, that there's a harmful reproductive effect to it in us. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Conception is something on the inside that'll give birth later. All sinful actions, the Bible teach, start as an embryo of sorts on the inside, in our heart. And if we let that desire um, that feels so right, play itself out. Don't be naive about where all this is headed. The strategy leads all the way to a grandchild. Did you notice that? Every time we yield to temptation, it's with, with a view of relief. We feel it'll lead to where we long to go, relief and satisfaction. But he's saying that's where this stealth strategy of our desires is so deceptive. It blindfolds us. And instead of taking us where we want to go, it leads us in exactly the opposite direction, all the way to a trap of sorts called death. There's a South American vine apparently known as the matador. Beginning at the foot of the tree, the matador vine slowly works its way to the top. But as it grows, it starts to snuff the life out of the tree. And when at last it tops the tree, it sends forth a flower to crown itself. Matador, by the way, means killer. Well, James isn't trying to be hard on us, but he's trying to help us. Be sober-minded, he's saying, so we're not naive about where that that may feel harmless in the way of a desire is headed. Now, one conclusion you could draw from this is that since desire is at the heart of this dark strategy, we should just put a damper on it altogether. The word James uses for desire, though, is interesting. Epithumia, epi, like an epicenter of our being, the command central of our soul. It's not a bad place. It's a broken place. Desires aren't inherently evil. They're misdirected. God isn't a stoic. He doesn't want to destroy our desires, but to redirect them. It's like our desires resemble an autoimmune disease. Instead of fighting for us, they've turned against us. So if we're going to make progress against temptation, we've got to become more self-aware of our desires. For instance, if you're tempted to lash out and get angry with someone, what desire is behind that? Now, often it's fear, if we're honest. That's Rampant right now because our world is so destabilized, very understandable to feel out of control. There's a fear, but when we let that fear drag us away to try to control things by becoming harsh or angry with someone, that's the broken inner self at work. 
That's how the strategy behind temptation takes advantage of us and through us, others. So that's the source of temptation, the strategy behind temptation. Now, lastly, let's look at the solution for temptation. When you reflect on James' words, I think several things come to mind in the way of a solution. First, because the strategy involves self-deception, we've got to start by admitting we can't do this on our own. Don't be deceived, he says, my dear brothers and sisters. James counsels us as a good pastor. The very language of brothers and sisters invites us to think of this as a family matter, that we're not on our own to figure this out. We're in this together, that we need each other. We need safe friendships in life, in the church, where we give others access to our inner world, to our thoughts, as frightening as that may seem, so that we can, in love, not judgment, help one another guard against self-deception. Honestly, I don't know where I'd be spiritually, or in life, for that matter, if I didn't have people like this in my life that I could confide in, safe friends of the riddling, perplexed, labyrinthical soul. We all need that. Secondly, in the way of a solution, James once again directs us to truth about God that we need to take to heart. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows, he says. On this Father's Day, which I know can be a complicated time for many, James points us to our ultimate Father. He's not like shadows that are always shifting around. You can count on this Father, rely on him. He'll always be there. And one of the reasons James is so insistent that we not yield to temptation is that he doesn't want us to forfeit the far better gifts that only the Father can provide which makes me think of C.S. Lewis' incredible insight that I've come back to over the years many times from his collection of essays, The Weight of Glory. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the author of A Holiday at the Sea, we are far too easily pleased. Finally, in terms of a solution, when James talks about every good and perfect gift, that word for gift is the same in Greek as the word for grace. What's the greatest gift of grace that he gives? He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. It's interesting, right, that he returns to the birth metaphor again. While dysregulated desires in us lead in the wrong way, a birth that leads eventually to death, the birth that he offers leads to a new life brimming with the possibility of fruitfulness. Uh, What is that word of truth? Well, the scriptures, God's word. What's the central message of it? That is the catalyst for the new birth in us, the gospel. Just before Jesus entered the wilderness to endure temptation, When he was baptized in the Jordan River by John, an extraordinary moment occurred. Heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. A voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. It's this Son whom the Father loved that endured temptation for us. Not only those 40 days in the wilderness, Over the course of his life, he endured a world of temptation. He was tempted in every way, which, by the way, makes him an especially empathetic savior. And at the end of his life, he wrestled with his father in a garden. It wasn't easy, but this son stood that test. From that garden, he was dragged away by the desires of evil forces. He was hung on the cross and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, Jesus was always referring to God as his Father, and now that's conspicuously absent. Why? So Jesus, who never succumbed to temptation, would voluntarily take the place of all of us who have and receive the outcome we deserved. When we receive this by faith, trusting in it as the word of truth, it gives us that new birth. And the outcome of that, the same love and pleasure the Father has for the Son, he now showers on us. When we take that truth to our heart, down into the epicenter of our soul, it'll begin to redirect our desires toward ultimate satisfaction. 
John Owen, a long time ago, said, only a sight of his glory and nothing else will truly satisfy us. Our hearts are like a magnetized needle, which cannot rest until it is pointing north. We will always be restless until we come to Christ and behold his glory. Listen, come to him who is tempted and tried like we are. Come to true north. And don't you know the Father, the Father, who is utterly dependable and unimaginably good, has a heaven full of gifts. He takes infinite pleasure in giving his children whom he loves so deeply. Why? Why would we ever settle for anything less?